You'll be listening to an interview with Chuck, an ex-investment banker who turned regenerative farmland manager. We talked about one of the great bottlenecks of scaling the regenerative agriculture business. The shortage of good professional regenerative farmland managers and the role of retail and processing companies in this transition. Last but not least, we dove a bit deeper into taste and nutrients and the upcoming revolution around that. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! You'll be listening to an interview with Chuck, an ex-investment banker who turned regenerative farmland manager. We talked about one of the great bottlenecks of scaling the regenerative agriculture business. The shortage of good professional regenerative farmland managers and the role of retail and processing companies in this transition. Last but not least, we dove a bit deeper into taste and nutrients and the upcoming revolution around that. Thank you for listening to this interview. I hope you learned something about the importance and challenges of finding great regenerative farmland managers. And of course, why taste is going to change everything. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Koen van Seyen, your host. Today I'm joined by Chuck de Liederkerke, co-founder of Soil Capital. In their work, they partner with farmland owners, corporates, governments, public institutions and investors. They are committed to scaling and sustaining the regenerative agriculture movement through market-based solutions. They do this through advisory, management and investment activities around the world. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Koen. To start with a personal question, how do you end up in soil and building soil around the world? Well, I was working in investment banking in London, and I saw a TED talk uh, of Alan Savory. And, uh, like we all did. Very, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very quickly, a light bulb went up in my head uh, where I realized that um, obviously there are clear environmental benefits and social benefits for regenerating land whether it be through livestock management or through any form of regenerative activity. But economically, if you can buy a marginal asset, which is unproductive, and transform it not only into a fertile piece of ground, but also have an operation that is yielding cash flows on it, then you're very powerfully aligning environmental outcomes and good financial performance. And the question that went up in my head was, is there a case that regenerative agriculture could be more competitive than conventional agriculture? If you look today at the own and operate models of farmland businesses where they own the land and operate on that land. The return on invested capital is in the mid single digits. And um, when you think of it from uh, think about it from a, an investor's point of view, maybe some find it acceptable. As soon as you look at it from a farmer's point of view, the paradox is you have some people that are actually quite wealthy asset wise, but uh, Quite often for many of them, they're 
their returns are very meager. And the whole value chain around agriculture today is optimized, or so we would suppose, in order to help those farmers achieve the best potential return on investment out there. And today that is 5%. Is it possible that uh, we can give them 6% or 7%? Which is a bit disappointing when you come from investment banks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the asset class, but uh, yes, you, you suppose you could do better or you, you'd hope for, you'd hope for that. The point here is if you can outperform conventional agriculture, all of a sudden you can demonstrate that the right economic choice for all of the players that are pooling their money into land, into working capital, into um, equipment, all the manufacturers of that equipment are going to start serving farmers that are going to go for that extra one or two percent that regenerative agriculture could potentially deliver. And the moment you d demonstrate that the right economic choice is regenerative, you have the potential to completely transform how capital is allocated in agriculture. And there are trillions of dollars allocated throughout the agriculture value chain. If you want to drive meaningful environmental change, you're going to need to make it more profitable than the current state of affairs. And when you realize that, where did you start from investment banking in, in I'm, I'm assuming, a fancy office to building soil and, and founding soil capital? <laughs> yeah, the initial idea was we would become a fund. I partnered up with uh, our two co-founders today, uh, Nicolas Verskewer, who is a Belgian farm manager with experience in uh, broad acre farming initially in many different uh, large scale operations around the world. And um, Alex Trainor, who's a banker from a development bank focused on agribusiness credit. And uh, our idea initially was to invest in marginal farmland, regenerate the fertility of that farmland through regenerative practices and hopefully deliver the financial performance that went along with it. What ended up happening is that um, we became managers of portfolios that were already existing and we also helped out as consultants for other farmland owners that already had their management in place. Our approach has always been to um, look at these uh, operations and incrementally change them as to not compromise uh, cash flow generation. Typically what we do is uh, we look at the agrochemical package that is currently being applied on the land and uh, through a more fine-tuned analysis of what the plant requires in terms of nutrition and protection, adapt a package that is all too often very standard and very conventional to the plant's needs. That will immediately allow for some savings to occur. And part of those savings, we flow back to the owners of the, the farm. Another part of those savings we reinvest in trial areas to demonstrate that the regenerative practices will deliver better financial outcomes. So we'll, we'll plant a cover crop, we'll apply some compost, we'll invest in some no-till equipment, and really try to demonstrate as fast as possible that no short-term economic impact, negative economic impact, was necessary to kickstart a transition and to continue that transition. So you're, you're basically looking for some inefficiencies or waste in the current chemical mix or the current input that, that this farm or this farm operator is applying. And then by becoming more efficient on that side, 
freeing up some cash flow, first of all, for the owners, so they, 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 they are still happy. And second of all, to start trying some regenerative, the first regenerative steps on some trial patches, but not doing that on the full scale yet, because that would be too much of a, of a shock uh, for, for the whole system involved. And of course, if, you've, if you prove it on the small batches, then the scaling up towards the, the more efficient, but still in, in non-regen uh, um, managed patches is, should be quite straightforward. Yes. The idea is really to get the landowners or the farm managers that are on location convinced about the merits of our approach. And unless they can really see it for themselves, the risk of setting yourself up to fail is very big. So that initial trial period for us is necessary simply in order to have the right relationships with with the farm managers. And, and what kind of crops are, or what kind of systems are we talking about, just to have an idea? I mean, I, I would definitely link your website below. You can see a lot of a lot of your portfolio, basically what you've worked on, which is very diverse. What are the a, a few that, that keep coming back, basically? You keep being asked for certain types of, of crops, certain types of systems, countries. So we, uh, we're starting to have quite a diverse experience now. Initially, our, our team has experience in broadacre farming and a little bit in livestock. More recently, we've gained experience in the fruit and vegetable uh, sector, mostly fruit trees. And this spans across uh, many different climates. We've uh, farmed in Mediterranean climates, subtropical climates, and tropical climates. So we've we farm crops from, or sorry, I should rather say we've we've uh, managed farms producing avocados, apples and pears, bananas, pineapples, and this across uh, several continents, uh, Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Asia to some extent. Do you see similarities uh, between, you know, their sizes probably are very different, their, their, their crops, as you mentioned, are very, very different. Um, what are some main lessons of how to transition to regen egg? I think the agronomy is one piece and being regenerative agronomically is obviously the right choice. If, if you want to talk about the similarities across all of these farms, it's the principles of regenerative agriculture that matter. For us, we have five principles and we should build this into some form of a common definition of, of regenerative agriculture. These mm -hmm. principles are minimal land disturbance, permanent cover of the soil with vegetation, maximization of biodiversity in time, which means rotations, but also in space, which means companion crops. And it also means the introductions of the introduction of ruminants, livestock in the system. We, we see this as an essential piece of, of the regenerative equation. The minimization of agrochemical inputs with a view to their elimination. And there's this big debate going on around whether a regenerative is or should be organic. I think, yes, in time it should enable a transition to organic in a less risky fashion than a, a cold cut three year transition might. But you're not going to achieve the promise of a regenerative system without organic in time, in a de-risked fashion, in our view. And the last piece is what we call context-specific design. And this draws from the principles of permaculture. And we try to apply really an adaptation of the production unit to its environment, to the topography, to the climate, to the features of the landscape on large scale farms. That's the agronomic piece. What we have come to understand over a period of time managing these farms is that it's just as important to have an extremely professional farmer and, as to have a regenerative farmer. Because if you're a regenerative farmer, but 
you're not, you know, able to execute on your regenerative plan and deliver the results of your plan, then you're going to fall short of expectations. Do you see that as the missing piece in, in, in the sector to have good, reliable, professional, regenerative farmers or even farmers in general? Yes. For me, I see we've, we've all, or m many of us who have been involved in capital raise, who've been involved in uh, finding opportunities, have experienced uh, the difficulty to run those activities. But ultimately, once you've actually raised and deployed your capital, you need to run the operation. And as long as you're in the business of raising and deploying capital, it's okay to be the suit in London or New York or Singapore or San Francisco. As soon as you need to manage the operations, you need a farm. And that guy needs to be reliable, which means you need to trust him and he needs to be able to... Or her. Or her, absolutely. Uh, you need to trust him or her. And, and this person needs to be able to execute a plan. In very challenging circumstances, because you're often extremely remote, especially if you're large scale and, and probably introducing, I mean, if you go through your five steps, which, which also seem like they get more complex as you go down the line, if you get to number five, you're going against everything your neighbors are doing and everything your friends are, are or you're at least the people you work with in the immediate surroundings are, are doing quite the opposite. Yes, absolutely. The isolation and the willingness to be different is probably the, the most complex piece. But you need to add on top of that that this person needs to be financially literate. Yeah, because otherwise the guy in the suit comes and says, uh, eh, but where are the results? And you say, yeah, but the weather was different. And it was, you don't understand. I mean, the, 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 the distance literally, but, but probably even bigger between a suit in London and a farm in, in Belgium or a farm in Argentina or in Italy is, is absolutely enormous. They're completely different worlds. Yeah. So it's very clear that the suits in London, like me. Uh, Sorry, we, we sound really bad about the suits in London. I don't want to, don't want to go in a negative <laughs> tone, but just to, to characterize a bit, that's the, that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that that's the way that most farmers look at us. You know, when we're raising capital, we talk about regenerative agriculture, but from the point of view of the farmer that's day in, day out practicing this thing, it's still a very different reality. And it's very clear that we need to open our eyes to what their reality is. But it's just as true that they need to be open to what the investor's reality is and what the investor's expectations are and what the milestones to deliver those targets actually are. And they need to be able to talk to those milestones. And there's some reporting that happens. And you need to be in business with a farm manager that's open to do that. On top of that, you're right. You need to be um, in business with a farm manager that's innovative and willing to learn from people who don't know his farm as well as he does because regenerative agriculture is an evolving science or art. And we are still at a moment where there are a lot of, gains that are appearing that are new and if people aren't trying new things and if people aren't learning from each other then uh, very quickly you find yourself pigeonholed into a new set of practices which probably aren't the best ones and then once you have that reliable financially literate and innovative person you need to get him or her willing to go live in that isolated place and usually if this person is talented they can have a top job as a portfolio manager or as a junior as a portfolio manager if they're still quite young in a big city with exciting opportunities. So it takes a very particular personality to want to do that. And that's what we're focusing on with Soil Capital. Yeah, because how do you fix that? It sounds like a daunting task to convince, not convince, but to get a group of, of good professional farmers that, that are that I mean these these characteristics are, are quite specific. So what, what's your work on that and your your journey ahead as you're starting to focus more and more on on getting that group of, of good farmers together? So the way we'll work 
typically with a, a farm that wants to transition to regenerative is we will send a person, usually a person that has a degree in agronomy, who has several years, five to 15 years experience in managing large scale farms and who's willing to live on location for at least a certain period of time. This person will arrive for minimum three months and take control of the operations or sit by the existing manager and redefine a business plan. More often than not, to be fair, uh, for a while, uh, these people take control of the operation and they'll put together a business plan in light of the realities of the field, something that they could believe can be executed and they'll hire the local team. And then for anywhere from another six months to 12 months, they'll work with the local team overseeing them to make sure that the targets are well understood that the principles of regenerative agriculture are well understood and that uh, the results are actually being delivered. And once that degree of trust and credibility and knowledge of the operation has been established between the local teams and the soil capital person, that person would typically withdraw from the operation it sounds like a short period of time, like this is less than a year you're talking about. Well, you really want to empower the local people quite quickly, but you also want to build a meaningful relationship with them. And if you stay too long, you're not going to empower them. If you stay a too short period of time, the risk of you building a business plan that doesn't really capture the local reality and the constraints and it's just a theoretical exercise. And the risk of you not knowing your people well enough down the road to have frequent relationships with them that enable you to really understand what's happening on the ground and whether actions need to be taken or not is there. So it's important to, to take time, but not too much time. And then when, when the soil capital person comes back, you'll see that usually they talk weekly with the local teams. And typically these people have an appetite for diversity in their projects. And once they've gone to one country and have been back in Belgium for one or two months, or I say Belgium or, or London for that matter, they'll be happy to go to another country and do the same thing again. And so really what we try to do is get a plan that uh, is able to meet the expectations of the investors or at least align the investors what we feel is credibly possible in the field and make sure that down the road that that plan can be followed up in the right way and then also make sure it's regenerative yeah of course and just to switch gears a bit, what, what have you been busy with for the last few months or what are you busy with, let's say, until the end of the year? It's now the end of October 2018. What is something you can share, obviously, um, of, of some exciting things that are going on at the moment in, in soil capital? So alongside our, our farm management services, which we've been talking about mostly, we've recently opened uh, or launched, I would say, a, a new type of activity, which we've called business and government solutions. What does that mean? We have realized that the farmers usually are very good at controlling their costs, very good at optimizing their volumes. But when it comes to price, most farmers are still price takers. And that's very understandable. But when it comes to regenerative agriculture and you're farming a crop that's better for the planet, that's 
probably healthier for people. Why do you say probably there? Well, health claims are yet to be proven. And uh, I'm, I'm cautious of, of asserting too, too quickly things that aren't proven. For sure, it tastes better, right? For sure, it tastes better. What we believe is, you know, a plant grown in a healthy soil will have a greater ability to metabolize complete protein chains, will have an ability to metabolize the plant secondary metabolites or what is more commonly called essential oils that are responsible for the flavors, but also some of the health benefits that we recognize in fruits. And so when we say that a fruit has lost, you know, X amount of its nutritional value since the moment our, our grandparents were eating, were our age, sorry, what we mean is that the, the soil is not alive enough to allow the plant to feed itself from it and to metabolize its minerals into full protein chains and complete uh, plant secondary metabolites. And I think that that's uh, something that um, we will need to be focusing on in the future. It will be a game changer in the market, but for the moment, it, it's still hard to elicit. The point is... Unclear, yeah. Yeah. But we need to be ready when the sector changes. And the sector meaning the food sector, when the farm to fork, which now somehow stops at the farm gate, uh, but the farm to fork movement starts looking at nutrient rich food or dense food, so looking more and more at taste, which you see already a bit. And that line between healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy produce, and healthy gut, and thus healthy people becomes a much straighter one in the next, let's say, hopefully five years. We need to be ready to. To, to supply that demand, which is probably going to get quite big. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that's why it's critical for farmers that are supplying into the retail markets to understand that the moment that this comes around, there'll be a very clear, very objective way of differentiating between a crop that's grown in a healthy soil and one that's not. And you want to find yourself on one end of that or one side of that line. In the meantime, we need to find another way to elicit a premium. Yeah, sorry, we, we're going to get back to your business unit or to your, your new activity and, and that business unit. This was a bit of a, a side <laughs> a side track. I think that's, that's what the, the main effort of the business and solutions activity of Soil Capital is today. It's to engage with those buyers of agricultural products, whether they be retailers, whether they be food chains, whether they be processors and manufacturers of food products, to understand how they can meet an increasing demand for regenerative crops that's happening. I think um, in the market, you're seeing that this is, this is appearing. A uh, company like uh, Carrefour, the, the French retailer, has made very clear statements about their agroecological commitment, which is just another word for regenerative agriculture. Yeah, and just to background, yeah. I think Carrefour is like the second largest uh, supermarket chain in the world, I think, after Walmart. So they, this, is, this is a big deal. Even if they are the third or the fourth, it's a huge, it's not your local I have five shops and, and super sustainable organic shop. It's a gigantic a machine. And there are others. There's there's Danone, to name another French company. Is France leading the way? I, that's a good question. I think France and the US are, are, are both leading the way. You have companies like General Mills that are also tackling this topic in the US. You know, obviously, if you dig into this, you'll see that a, a large number of companies are there. Blue Apron, the... Um, meal kit delivery company that IPO'd two years ago. Made some huge commitments. Yeah. Made the same commitments. And with the ESG goals of the United Nations, this, this will only drive more attention towards a topic. The SDG. SDG, yeah, sorry, the, the SDG goals. What I think, I think there's a risk in there that 
everyone talks about regenerative agriculture, but in the meantime, there's still no definition of regenerative agriculture. And unless we, as a regenerative farm-focused community, come to a consensus about what is regenerative agriculture, we may well find ourselves in a situation where that word becomes meaningless, and that would be a problem. Because there's a true potential for regenerative agriculture to actually fix major global issues. But the moment this becomes a meaningless buzzword, we're going to have a lot of backpedaling and redefinition to do. And so we shouldn't miss our opportunity to define it. What would be a, a start from your end on, on a definition? Well, the, the principles that I, I've discussed, you know, that they come pretty close. Yeah. They need to be attached to some very specific metrics. I think the route to organic must be clear. And I think that there are a number of other factors that provide a holistic framework to what regenerative agriculture is doing. The Rodale Institute recently, or not, actually not so recently, um, last year, published its uh, framework for its regenerative organic certification, and they're progressing well with their pilot farms there. Yeah, working together with Patagonia and, and Dr. Bronner's. Exactly. That's a very, very welcome initiative. The Savory Institute is looking at an outcomes-based certification, which they've recently announced. There are a number of these initiatives. I think um, they should be compatible. And I think we should get behind one of them. And, and, and both of these are in, in the US. Do you see something in, in Europe, maybe in France, if, if France is leading the way here? Do you see something, let's say, outside the US that is um, pushing on this? Not as clearly. And um, my concern is that if a retailer decides that they're going to provide the definition of regenerative agriculture, then the risk of this not being a common topic increases. So I think it needs to be an independent body that does this. And look, as far as I'm concerned, If you look at uh, these labels, there's still a lot of work to do for tropical crops, for Europe, for the fresh market, if you're talking about fruit and vegetables, because a lot of these definitions are, I would say, conceptualized with a certain type of farmer in mind. But there are many, many different types of farms in many different areas of the world, and a lot of them could benefit from, from these labels. So what I think we need to do is, is really look at what regenerative means for a banana farm, for uh, a, a farmer in the Midwest, and then a permaculture farm uh, in Austria. And if you can you know, find a common definition or way of labeling regenerative for all these people and some metrics that ideally demonstrate that financial outcomes and environmental outcomes are aligned, uh, then you've got a really powerful tool. And, and is that something you're going to be focusing on or you are focusing on at the moment with this new business unit? No, the, the, not, not directly. The way we engage with retailers is really helping them understand what a regenerative operation is. If we have a definition, it's better. And we would be very happy to advance a definition that achieves consensus. But um, ultimately, you need to understand what a regenerative banana looks like. You need to understand what a uh, regenerative pineapple looks like. You need to understand what a regenerative barley looks like. And I think there's, there's a double opportunity there. There's a premium that can benefit everyone. And so there's a way to market this this isn't our speciality but if you have the right farmers that can supply to you you already have a good portion of the equation and then you know we often say uh with the team here that farmers could come to regenerative agriculture for the premium and stay for the cost savings because ultimately if you're adding natural fertility to your soil then your input requirements are going to go down and therefore that's going to benefit your cost structure what we want to do is get those retailers to understand or whether it's retailers 
or other buyers of agricultural product to understand that not only can they get a premium, but they can also share into the cost savings. And you know, when you're when you're a big buyer of agricultural products, a cost saving on the farm that can be that can be shared is is sometimes very meaningful. And we think that um, you know our mission is still to scale regenerative agriculture. We can do it by leading by example in in farms, but um, if we can also help farmers access marketplaces that value their crop, we can drive significant change there as well. So we need to have the relationships with the market. Yeah, the the journey doesn't stop at the farm gate. And, and I would love to check in on a later stage when there's some projects under your belt, which um, is going to be very interesting to dive in deeper because I see that with a lot of a lot of people on, on this show and a lot of people in general in Regen Ag and food, that you need to somehow um, catch part of that premium um, because you, you've created so many externalities, positive externalities for the rest of the world. If you're only being paid and compared to the next barley or to the, the, the normal pineapple, you're really missing out, um, which is a shame until obviously the whole healthcare uh, discussion we had before uh, becomes much clearer. This is a, a absolutely crucial, crucial route. Yeah, absolutely. And let's imagine there's a, a full theater of impact investors, smart impact investors, obviously, listening to this podcast and they want to get into soil they want to get into regen ag they might be living in in amsterdam or they're living in berlin or, or maybe in buenos aires um what would be without giving investment advice obviously your advice where, where to get started they've read some books they've seen alan savory maybe they've been to some conferences and um, what would be a good just like there's a good first step for a farmer to start uh, th that journey, which is a long journey with many, many uh, obstacles and barriers and many great moments, hopefully, what would be the first step for, for an investor to start this regenerative investing journey? I would encourage investors to meet with regenerative farmers and to have uh, meaningful conversations with them because it's still a, a work in progress. And uh, there's a lot that's being invented. There are many opportunities. Nowhere can you see more concretely than with the farmer what are the possibilities, but what are the complexities of, of regenerative farming. I would also talk to the investors that have already a few years behind their belt with capital allocated into these projects to understand from them you know, a few years down the road, what they've what they've benefited and where they feel improvement is still needed. You know, I, I'd like to give a, a shout out to uh, Paul McMahon, who wrote a book uh, a few years ago, which I find is still a very good primer into the food sector feeding frenzy. I also think that's a very good place to start. Understanding the food sector at large and the global issues that are facing that sector is very important. This is not just an, a niche activity that's separate of the rest of the world. This is very much something that's deeply connected with environmental issues, with political issues such as food security, with social issues like the livelihood of the people on the land uh, that is uh, either being farmed or can no longer be farmed, but has the potential to, to be farmed again. And um, obviously with uh, the, uh, the financial markets. I think it's excellent advice. I think too many people with means or investors are, it's very easy obviously to consume a lot of this content and information from a distance, the books, the TED talks, the videos, the YouTube, the podcast, like I'm doing. But to actually go out and meet the farmer that produces the soy for your, your burger or the soy that goes into your um, the, the meat you're eating or to visit the farmer that, that produces the pineapple or the organic banana you're buying sometimes in the supermarket. I mean, if you are an investor and you have the means to do that, please do, because it's completely, it's incredibly enlightening to do that and to really see it with your own eyes instead of easily going to, yeah, we should plant more trees. 
which is obviously true, but it's not so easy if you are a farmer with a limited space. And there are so many, um, it's really, like you said, work in progress. And, and if you have the means, even locally, find your farmer's market, find the most regenerative one and go and visit and talk and see and taste and feel the land and feel the soil and get your, your boots dirty. And then obviously talk to some experienced investors in, in the space, which probably have, have a lot to share. Absolutely. And final question, if you could wave your, your magic wand and you could change one thing, so if you could change one thing in the regenerative ag space overnight, so we will all wake up tomorrow and it's Saturday and, and, and Chuck has changed something, what, what would that be? So short of having all the farmers farming regeneratively, which is probably too direct, I would say that we need, you know, we would have a KPI, a metric to measure the carbon we store in our soils and possibly other environmental benefits. And it would be a clear metric that we could correlate to the financial performance of regenerative farms or of any farming operations. Because I'm sure that this would define regenerative. Are you adding carbon to your soil sustainably? Or not. Yeah. Or not. Are you mining it? It, it would demonstrate regenerative agriculture's potential to fix urgent global issues. And it would prove that regenerative agriculture is the right economic choice. And it's the question that comes back every time, whether it's with farmers, with investors, with buyers and consumers, how can you measure your impact on the planet? And if it's true that the soil is the biggest carbon sink in, on our planet, then it's urgent that we find a straightforward way to measure it. And you're saying it's not there yet. No, There's I no don't. Er easy way to measure carbon and then the correlation to financial return. Yeah, there's no easy way. There are many different ways. And it's not for the moment clear for uh, institutions uh, like, the clean development mechanism to certify carbon stored in soils through agriculture. And it's, it's even harder to measure it. So if we can do that, I think we'll have significantly advanced the cause of regenerative agriculture. Then I, I, I guess we get, should get to work. I mean, we have a day until tomorrow is Saturday. No, I'm joking. But I, <laughs> I do see that as a, it's a huge, every time I, I discuss metrics, almost everyone comes back to carbon. Like it, it's not the perfect one, but it's probably the crucial one that, that everything else relates to. Of course you have the social part, of course you have the water part, of course you have the nutrient part, but without the carbon, all the other parts probably aren't there. So that seems to be really the, almost a linchpin in the system in this case. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best proxy. That, that's clear. Yeah. The best proxy. I was looking for the word. Yeah. 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 So I want to thank you so much. Chuck, for, for your time this morning, sharing updates and, and sharing some very exciting work you, you're working on. And I'm very much looking forward to checking in in a couple of months, in a month or six or a year to see where you're at, because our space is moving so fast that, that many update calls are necessary. Thank you. And congratulations for your podcast. It's very useful work. And I hope there are many other interviews uh, where we can discover the other people that are doing great work out there. Yeah, you're number 43, so you're, I, I hope we're going to add many, many others. I, I truly hope so. Thanks. Thank you, Kuhn. Thank you for listening to this interview. I hope you learned something about the importance and challenges of finding great regenerative farmland managers. And of course, why taste is going to change everything. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.